one thing I, I was sad about was that the RuneQuest that's that that's currently available and maybe they'll make an a uh, source reference document for it like they are with hero quest i don't know but i'd love for them to recover that toolbox approach to allow people to encourage people to say make your whacked fantasy world here are a bunch of runes mm. make gods make cults that's 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 one of the big tensions with glorantha in general isn't right. it that you've got that problem of you know it, it's sufficiently broad and detailed and sophisticated that everybody always looks for the, the the way it is and so you lose some of that inventing it yourself part but then somebody does invent a, invent something themselves and publishes it so other people think that now that means that that's official and right that's where all that stuff starts coming from. Yeah, there's there's kind of two levels we're talking about. One is to keep playing in Glorantha but make up some stuff. And then there's what I was talking about, which is more like what we did, which was just to say, okay, I'm doing my yeah. whole thing from scratch. But it supports either one. Mm. And so um, there's, there's other stuff which is pretty easy to understand for any student of mythology. For example... Uh, the cult of the mother, the earth mother, is actually the same thing throughout all the religions. They are connected. Right. And so stuff like that. I mean, it's pretty easy to, to riff off of that. Um, you for also... A while, hmm? For a while, there was a very rich culture of uh, fanzines about, uh, about Glorantha. I th and yeah. they published a lot of material from... Uh, readers, players, uh, mm -hmm. they wanted to add a cult, a god, a something. Uh, and uh, this, uh, I don't know if uh, it's still going uh, uh, around, but uh, it uh, became uh, more difficult when, uh, with the pub when uh, uh, I think there was uh, something like uh, a, a stricter... Right. Uh, kind of rules uh, for them after a while. And, I, uh, yeah. Yes. It, well, it may have had something to do with getting into Chaosium publication. Mm. Because as long as it was just a bunch of zines, of fanzines, mm. then I guess that's okay. And you're right. I mean, they were running full blast by 1980. Mm. Trade Talk was into the double digits of issues by the time I even bought a copy. And I know that there have been, and I, I have various issues of various different zines scattered around. The Worms Footnotes, that's the one I remember mm -hmm. from being a teen. Um, I had the Dragon Newt issue. Which was, and so the, uh, oh geez. Another interesting thing. The original rules said you can't play a Dragon Newt. Because no player could properly do it. They just presumed that somebody playing an adventurer in a role-playing game simply would not have the right mindset to play a creature who, by any human standard, was insane because they were tapped into the cosmos differently from a person. Mm. Um, whereas, you know, to, to any number of us, we were like, well, wait a minute, you know. Sign me up. <laughs> I will play the Cosmic Dragon Newt, you know, no problem. Um, but the, um, but at the time, I mean, back in the early 80s, that sort of thing was considered flat out for players. Mm. Players are good to hold their swords and to hit things. Good enough. Um, but the, uh, the, the situation for the zines... They kept going. I, I know people, I'm certain, have a encyclopedic knowledge of which ones were published and by whom. But what interests me are the ones that got into some kind of publication that made it into game stores. Um, one of the earliest was called the RuneQuest Companion which, as far as source books is concerned, is a hodgepodge of blithering confusion for anybody to jump into. Um, Greg and others were very, very fond of writing as sages trying to tell you about something. And so the unreliable narrator 
was actually a big piece of how they wrote. Um, which is kind of infuriating when you're 16 trying to actually, you know, read this stuff. Um, but, uh, so Glorantha had a share of published compilations, but you see if that jumps out of the zines and they put it in a cover and it gets staples and goes out to the game stores, you can see that everybody else is going to think that, okay, that stuff made it. And so you get this whole, well, it's published, it's canonical, you know, sort of fight gets going. Um, no surprise that Gloranthan fans have a deserved reputation for being fussy, argumentative, you know, mm -hmm. stubborn, um, proprietary, uh, self-righteous, but only toward each other. Yeah, it's it's interesting. That that was has always been one of my barriers with the Glorantha stuff. I I mean, I started knowing about Glorantha with White Bear Wow, uh, Red Moon. Yeah. The is... board game. I mean, it's actually what got me into a bunch of different role-playing things with different board games. Um and you know, it was always fascinating and I always found groups. And actually after I moved to California, I met some people who were really into Glorantha. But I could never find my in right. to where I could be part of it and I could understand enough of it to to really feel like this was something that will be part of my hobby and part of something that I will do, um, which is yeah. part of the reason why your RuneQuest thing was so great because it was new. It was something right. kind of based on that, but I didn't need to know anything mm -hmm. about the rest of it. Yeah, the, the tendency for one not to be into Glorantha, being into Glorantha is not enough. You have to be into the arguments about it. So, um, if one were to, you know, if one were to, one one could easily point to that particular sector of any number of organized religions, which is so obsessed with the interpretation of text that they become absolutely incomprehensible to everybody else, and everybody else just goes about the religion their own way and lets them fight it out. Um, but the and there's a little bit of, there's definitely a little bit of a disparity between the experience of reading it, where I think, you know, I mean, you know looking back over uh, uh, decades of of reading, who knows how accurately I'm remembering what I felt at the time, but you know there was a there was a maturity to this that right. was missing in a lot of role playing stuff that was just really appealing. There there, there was a real sense of of heft and and understanding that was not there and yet at the same time you know it could have complete silliness too well i but i like all that i mean it worked perfectly for me i i i i flag i fly my duck flag yeah <laughs> you know <laughs> as long as we're taking sides in the arguments about glorantha i know which of that side which side of that battle i'm on and so the um i don't know does robbie does that make any sense to you at all <laughs> Guys, shall we let him enjoy his his innocence? No, talk no. about the duck. Right. No, we've got to say something about ducks. If we're talking about this, <laughs> it's pretty easy to see where they came from. Howard the Duck was a huge hit in 1975, mm -hmm. and somebody puckish threw in the ducks as a race, and they were Howard. <laughs> Um, and so, um, and, and, you know, when, when people said, and said, well, yeah, you know, they, they were cursed by a wizard and mm -hmm. fantasy role-playing culture really honestly had no idea what to make of this for people who were kind of into the underground comics side of role-playing. It made perfectly good sense. You might as well have a duck as anything else. You know, mm -hmm. you are your serious, bearded, scarred warrior, and then there's this wisecracking, you know, four foot tall duck with a with a horn helmet on next to you. And okay then. Well, um, I, I wonder now that you mentioned this, I wonder if if some of that uh, influenced Dave Sim when he was doing his aardvark right, right um, in the fantasy setting. Thing. Sim has said that he deliberately did Cerebus as an homage to Howard. Mm. Um, 
both of them are very, very heavily influenced by the cartoons of Von Bode, who featured a very great deal of semi-anthropomorphic, pain-in-the-ass characters, often very sarcastic. Um, and so, um, and of course, we've got Daffy and Donald and all the rest of it, you know, to, to draw on you. We have no shortage of sarcastic, annoying, funny animal dudes um, to draw on. But um, but also, Cerebus was actually not originally created as a series character, but as a mascot for the company. So um, they, therefore, were going to call it Aardvark Press. But for whatever reason, I think it may have been his wife at the time's brother, who was the big fantasy the intense fantasy fan and gamer who insisted that it be called Vanaheim press. Apparently oh. Aardvark press was not cool. And so it had to be Vanaheim press, but so that's why it ended up being called of all things, Aardvark Vanaheim. Arguably <laughs> the worst possible choice they could have made <laughs> for the name of their company, but they did. Um, but uh, but anyway, so yeah, Cerebus was just supposed to be the mascot, and his odd name is actually a bona fide misspelling. It was supposed to be Cerberus. Mm -hmm. But, you know, artists can't spell, and you end up with Cerebus, and that's what happened. I guess a B looks like an R, and you just leave out the B, and, you know, there you go mix everything up mm. um but uh so there's a some funny history there but definitely cerebus is a piece of that exact confluence um the artist frank thorne may well have been involved with some of this as well he was kind of the glue between red sonya marvel and Artvark vanaheim and wendy and richard peeney so, therefore, there the and and there was another artist named Gene Day, who was who was active at Marvel and died young, and had a huge influence on all of them as well. Mm -hmm. So there was this group, and they included some gamers. Although Sim, in particular, was baffled by role playing and found the whole thing incredibly distasteful. Um, so uh, well, I, I do wonder about Wendy and Richard Peeney, however. Um, they, they, they sort of, they, they kind of have that gamer odor, you know, in some ways, um, not that gamer odor. So we should, uh, so, I mean, clearly, you know, the early room quest had its roots in the underground in tons of different ways. And that maturity combined with the audacity was absolutely characteristic of the underground comics and fantasy of the time. Um, Moorcock's work has been canonized in more ways than one, more meanings of that word than one, too much. But back then, Elric was considered to be basically rock and roll underground fantasy that didn't have to make sense mm. and, and could be ridiculous, and it was okay. So it's kind of interesting finding fantasy readers today who read Elric and say, this stuff is bullshit. You know, what on earth am I looking at? This makes no sense. And you have to say, well, I hate to sound old, but you're not reading it right. <laughs> um, did you guys know that Chaosium did Stormbringer, the role-playing game? Yep. Right. Yes. Um, and do you know who they got to write it? I did at one point, but I'm forgetting now. Yes, of all uh, people? Ken St. Andre. Yes. Okay. Right. right. So, and while he loves the books, and it's very clear, you know, the book that the game is written by somebody mm -hmm. who knows the books and likes them very much, um, it has a whimsical quality to it that simply throws all notions of game balance and. Uh, sort of the measured, fair approach to role-playing that was very much valued at the time in the early 80s 
Mm. He just throws it completely to the winds. And so, you know, a starting character can be a sorcerer with four demons or a sailor. And too bad, you know, that's what you get. That's, that's what you're going to do. Um, and so, uh, and so, but this was the last gasp, 1981. It's the last gasp of role-playing fantasy design that could be audacious, mm. I think. Um, and it's also why I think when we look at the Avalon Hill publication, which is a pre it's later, it took them a long time, early nineties, right? 1990, I think was when the first, the Avalon Hill RuneQuest 3 came out? Uh, no, uh, not 86, I think. Really? Okay. 85, yeah. 86. Uh, Maybe I got a later printing or version. Um, but uh, I can I can see it right there on the shelf, but I'm, I'm tethered by my earphones. <laughs> um, and so, uh, anyway, though, uh, it, it really shows what you're supposed to do with the fantasy role-playing game. You're, it's supposed to settle down and not upset you based on any particular result. Sort of very much what I think of as the GURPS thing. Whatever happens in GURPS, everybody knows that could happen. 